So technology is this thing that uh, informs and gives shape uh, to all of our lives. It sort of creates the conditions in which we exist. And yet, um, we we think critically about it very little. Um, it's it's almost as if it's a given or as if it's something that just is rather than something we create and construct. And I think that's a really interesting conversation to have just intellectually, but it's also really important to have as people of faith that if we're thinking about what does it mean to co-create uh, in, in terms of being uh, collaborators in God's project in the world, then we are uniquely pressed, I think, to, to be at the forefront of technological innovation and creation. And so for that reason, I think anybody who uses technology or has ever uh, been involved in any aspect of technology and is a person of faith will find this conversation really interesting. To my right is Phil Chen, who is a uh, Fuller alum, what year? 2005. 2005, okay. Um, and now the chief decentralized, or, or yeah, the chief decentralized officer, is that, am I saying that right? actually reverse uh, so decentralized the de Decentralized chief, chief officer yeah. of HTC and one of the creators of the Exodus phone, um, among a number of other things. So for us lay people, uh, when it comes to technology and what you do. Could you tell us what a decentralized chief officer is? And then maybe a little bit of the story about how you got there. What is it that brought you to that to that job? It, it is a funny title, I admit it. I, I didn't want it to be too serious. Uh, and then I also wanted to poke fun at, you know, this chief whatever title kind of and reverse it. But sort of on a higher level, it's it's sort of my view on leadership, right? Uh, I've been infatuated with this idea of a leaderless leader. And this concept, you know, really was born out, or at least for me, it was born out of, uh, you know, reading a lot of philosophy, but also just this whole Bitcoin movement. You know, in, in Bitcoin, as, as, as you probably know, it's, you know, this person named Satoshi Nakamoto, like nobody knows who this person is, um, he is the first anonymous multi-billionaire that we know of that hasn't come to claim his wealth or fame, you know, and he really is, or he or she or they is this anonymous person that dropped this, I think, a gift to the world and just simply disappeared. And the things that he, this Bitcoin stands for, you know, four things in particular, it's open, it's neutral, it's censorship resistant. Um, and it's borderless. So, you know, long story short, you know, decentralized chief officers, you know, kind of a poke fun of, you know, all the chief ex officers, but also just to tag like the whole point of me running this project is to decentralize myself too. Like, and I keep saying, like, I don't see myself as a captain of this Exodus ship or this movement. You know, I'm a fellow surfer uh, on this on this wave that we should all catch, so to speak. And um, and it's, it's a way for me to at least attempt to try to get the attention off of myself and and and, and more the the movement itself. How did you get there? Because I I don't normally or in the past wouldn't have said um, this is the future for a Fuller alum, right? Yeah. Um, so what what got you from here to there? So of course in your last year. Uh, uh, for your MDiv, you need to get an internship. And, you know, um, I chose this Korean immigrant church. It, it was a very aggressive missionary organization. You know, that one immigrant church had itself sent out, you know, over 250 missionaries around the world. They didn't need a pastor, they needed a youth, past, uh, youth teacher, none of that. They, sim they said, we simply need a driver that would pick up and drop off the missionaries that would come in and out of the church. And when they came back to the church, you know, they would be in high demand. People wanted to learn what they were doing on the field. People wanted them to pray for them. And and But nobody wanted to drive. <laughs> <laughs> when I came back to Fuller, uh, it became a huge deal because the, the offices thought that that was, um, uh, there was some injustice for somebody with a, going for a fuller degree, becoming a driver. And so it became an inter internship uh, issue because I, it wouldn't fulfill my uh, internship. But that was my kind of uh, way of getting educated with what was going on in the mission field globally. I was... Uh, in between Afghanistan and Tajikistan with a with a with a, a missionary there. 
um, and I was helping to build schools and orphanages. Uh, the schools mostly for girls. I was raising money, and I found the way we were doing stuff to be very inefficient. And so, long story short, I I uh, I had started a, a, a separate nonprofit um, called One Library Per Child. Um, because there was this new technology called e-ink, uh, which is a technology now that Amazon Kindle uses. Um, and, and my idea was like, oh, if I could build this thing, this device with an e-ink screen, no battery, uh, low batteries, if I could give it to a child, then uh, they would have you know, access to a library. And so every child could have their own kind of little library. That that nonprofit eventually turned into a company, and then raised money, and that's how I got started into the entrepreneurship kind of startup world. So it all started from that sort of missional impulse of meeting concrete needs on the ground, um, matched with your <laughs> ability to say these things are inefficient. Uh, how much? Yeah. Why don't we uh, do something about it? My sense is technology is so pervasive and entrenched in our lives um, that we depend upon it for just about everything. And yet the average person has a deep and profound ignorance regarding how it actually works. And so what that's created is a society where there's almost a, what I would call a mystical or mythic kind of relationship with technology because we depend upon it so, so thoroughly and yet it's mysterious how my picture actually gets sent to my wife, right? I mean, whatever that is. But if that's how technology operates with most people, that our pursuit and consumption and use of technology is really um, getting at some of these deep, what I would call spiritual longings um, in a society that has sort of moved past or beyond traditional religion per se. And so that technology is functioning in this religious sort of capacity at the same time that we're kind of mystified by it. Do you think society really is using technology to replace religion? And if so, what do we make of that as people who uh, identify with the Christian faith? This is something that a rabbi Jonathan Sachs spoke about. And he, you know, he talked about how, you know, Judaism started when, you know, uh, uh, alongside when, you know, the alphabet was, was invented, right? And that's a technology, right? And then, you know, Christianity was born out of, you know, letter writing, right? That's also a technology, right? Protestants, us, you know, because of the printing press and Gutenberg. And, and for me, it's, especially at the cultural moment we're at right now, there's always the new sort of literate class. Like who's that elite class that knows this new language that's pushing the boundaries of culture, right? It used to be the alphabet, it used to be writing, uh, it used to be reading a different language. And the moment we are right now is, uh, is data, right? And, and that's the, the new priests, so to speak. And literally, they are the new prophets, right? Because the Google, Amazon, Facebooks of this world, they literally are using all of our data to predict you know, what you want, what you want to buy, what you're thinking, what you're reading, right? And in that sense, uh, uh, they are the new prophets, right? Uh, they're able to predict your next thinking, their next move. And so, that's the new literate class, right? They know enough math, they know enough uh, computer science, they know enough, you know, backend data and all how these systems work to be able to do that. This new medium allows for a new type of message uh, to keep pushing the boundary and, and culture forward, uh, forward or cyclical, however you want, what model you want to think about. But at this moment, you know, uh, data and artificial intelligence, that is the new literate class. They're the new priests and the new prophets and kings for sure in our age. I'm really interested that you're talking about data science. As you develop new products in the coming generations, how do you leverage uh, data science to help you de uh, develop these and look into the future. And also, I'm curious about just unstructured data. How do you dive into that? Like, just to help develop new products, what methods do you use? Yeah, 
and preface this, preface your question on, on this kind of idea. And, and it's the idea around, it's still around Bitcoin. For you to own your Bitcoin, you need to own something called your private keys, right? Um, and we're using that same foundation uh, for you to be able to own uh, some digital ass, something that you own is not owned by a third party, right? And so an example is today, none of you in this room own your digital identities, right? Today you sign into a third party, either with your Google or your Facebook, right? Mm -hmm. Um, you don't own your payment rails. You you know it's it's all owned by a third party. The interesting with Bitcoin is um, uh, you have to own it, or is it, it you know it's because it's money, right? And so you have to own your private keys. Now that revolves around this concept called uh, that I'm trying to sort of push is you know this concept of digital property, right? What I'm appalled by. Uh, um, at this current state of technology is we're this far down what we call the information age or this idea of the internet and, and there's no concept of digital property, right? These, this, all of your digital property is owned by a third party uh, down to the point where there's, you, you, there's no such thing as you owning your own identity. And so an example is just, we, you know, we're trying to build technology that empowers you as the user to start owning your property, right? Because everything, you know, in an extractive economy, uh, it happens because of weak property rights, right? And in the Old Testament, you see a lot of stuff around property rights, right? And, and, and that needs to be a foundation and fundamental. And so I wanna preface your question around that because we have to start there as what there should be some definition of digital property and hence data and how you manage data, right? Whether it's structured or not, right? And with that, it also then means what's your digital property, what's mine, but also the whole conversation around privacy. I think it's interesting that today, for example, Tim Cook and Apple, they talk a lot about privacy isn't that their whole new uh, marketing bit? It's yes. something about, and I wonder if it was a response to <laughs> the Exodus. No, but what's funny is it's all about privacy, but it doesn't say anything about ownership. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. it's private to a point where Apple, we know everything about you, <laughs> yeah. but, but we won't share it, right? <laughs> Digital property is more fundamental than privacy. And I, I honestly don't understand how can you talk about privacy when you don't talk about digital property? Like, what is yours? What is mine? You know, and it's a, it's a fine line, yes, but that line needs to be drawn, right? And the problem right now with the internet is that line is not drawn. And so then the follow-up question then becomes, how do you still do all the things you want to be able to do with Google, with Yelp, you know, with Uber, uh, and still have your privacy, right? Right, how, do you, how, do you, how are you able to still either earn money from your data or keep your data private but still enjoy all the recommendations and all the services and all the free stuff that you can, right? And there is a lot of technology there being developed and that's the space that we're investing in that is able to extract still the intelligence uh, from your data without taking your data, right? And so there's a lot of technologies there, whether structured or not, uh, that you can do that, that still respects people's digital property but still be able to do what you still want to do and what you're still accustomed to uh, from a Google or Amazon recommendation and things of that nature, right? Because these things have been so easy and so helpful at the same time. So we don't want to take that anything from that away, but we still want to ha start with the foundation of, you know, res restoring somebody's digital dignity, so to speak. you are talking about seems to be a technology that takes into account a sense of our theological anthropology, a sense of who we are as humans and what we're owed as humans from other humans. Um, what do you make of kind of the shift that we're seeing now um, away from a, 
it seems to me, away from a disruption model to a, wait a second, how do we humanize the disruption? How do we take advantage of uh, social um, structures that have been there a long time to make sure that this disruption doesn't run amok in our societies? Do you think that that's going to become more common as we think about these aren't just technology solutions, they're people solutions. My take is, I guess, the tech fundamentalists have taken this conversation too far in terms of complete, like, the whole singularity conversation, like, you know, the ultimate evolution of humanity is to be these super intelligence machines. I mean, that's, that I just find completely ridiculous, right? And then, so, that's actually the starting point conversation. Right, and then you say, no, 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 but we want to humanize these machines and you know, make it more relevant to humans, right? But I think even in the AI space, there's like two big camps. And this is, these two camps actually started in the 1960s. Uh, there's this AI camp, uh, and right now represented by Ray Kurzweil and the artificial intelligence movement. And then the other is more, uh, the opposite is called IA, which is intelligence augmented. And so you, how you think about uh, technologies that just support human, um, you know, productivity. And I would, I myself find this, even the secular, um, you know, AI kind of thinkers in this space to be more in this realm than that, because this, this is just, it's clickbait. It's what the media wants to write about. And so it gets, it gets the big uh, megaphone. Uh, but the real, real science and technology, it's still centered around this. So unfortunately, of course, because of the media, this realm of singularity, you know, computers taking over the world, blah, 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 has, has, has taken, uh, you know, taken all the mind share, so to speak. There, there's a very interesting uh, writer in, uh, in the Bitcoin say, uh, space, called, his name is Nick Zabo. Uh, I think he's the, uh, there are two main thinkers in this space, Nick Zabo and Andreas Antonopoulos. Um, and Nick Zabo has this um, fascinating way of thinking about it. Uh, and he calls it um, wet code and dry code. Dry code, of course, is just, you know, algorithms, it's just math, it's computer science, and wet code, of course, it's, it's human being. And that's law. That's the laws we write on paper. That's interpreted by human beings. And so the whole point of the social key recovery is, yes, it is a human problem. Like, people come to me and says, um, what if I don't have any friends? <laughs> and I'm like, that is a human problem, right? You can't share your keys to your friends and family. That's absolutely a problem I cannot solve, right? But... I am pushing you towards you to have more community, right? Maybe that's that's my opportunity to be more <laughs> gospel centric. I'm forcing you to use this technology so you can build more community, <laughs> so you can rely more on friends and family. If the takeaway of this thing I'm building is for you to depend more on your friends and family, I think I've succeeded, right? I think that's a good message to spread, right? That's a message I could put a stake on and say, yeah, I stand for depending more on your friends and family instead of being self-sufficient and independent, right? We want to be more dependent, rational animals than, you know, this independent, sovereign kind of... If I can respond real quickly. Because sure. what that sounds like you're creating is not a technological solution. It's a technological problem that's demanding a human solution. Absolutely. And you're creating like a, a mystery box that has to be, you have to get your friends and family together. And so uh, that's... And then that gets to my idea about leadership, right? When you lead uh, and you empower somebody to use this technology and when they have done it they will not say thank you they will say thank you I did it myself right and so when you truly are giving people the tools and empowering them to do what they need to do and take responsibility of their own whether it's private keys or digital property and when they do it then they have grown they've built their community but they will say they did it themselves, right? They're not saying we outsourced it to some third party uh, and uh, we're happy to pay you uh, if something goes wrong, right? It's about taking ownership and, 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 and responsibility. And if you mess up, uh, it's your responsibility, right? 
Uh, and that's how it should be in, in, in some, <laughs> in a very human sense. I've seen different like grants and, and whatnot that will invest in people designing AI that incorporates a philosopher and a psychologist and an ethicist, et cetera. And I go, wow, that's really great. It doesn't seem very economically viable. These are all big foundations that have vested interest. So how do you get this sort of message of, of leadership in that space that says we can't just outsource the ethical or theological or philosophical questions, but it still gives you an ROI that's worth your investment, right? That, that you can invest your time as an entrepreneur in this space, but I want you to always keep in mind these other things in play when the whole industry seems to work at odds with that. It wants you to, to make the money at the expense of some of those maybe more cumbersome or long-term decisions that you have to make. A, a few comments. First is, uh, uh, it reminds me of a book you should all read uh, called uh, Weapons of Math Destruction. <laughs> it's a, uh, this lady named Kathy O'Neill. And she defines algorithms as prejudice coded in math. Huh. Right? Wow. And that's what it is, right? Mm. Um, and the second thing I like to say is, I, I, I was at the. Are, are you familiar with AlphaGo? So the uh, the Google DeepMind Go player that beat the human being oh. Lee Sedol. Uh, this so this happened in 2015, which is the first time a computer beat somebody in the game of Go. Um, I was there uh, in Korea, and I remember I, I sat behind Eric Schmidt. And later I asked the founder of DeepMind, because one of the interesting things about modern AI, as you alluded to, it's all trained by data, right? And we actually don't know, uh, and it goes through what you call neural networks in this mysterious block, black box, and we don't know how it makes decisions. Mm -hmm. And so what, what I found, and we were investors in DeepMind, and in his, PowerPoint presentation, he ends with uh, a Richard Feynman quote about um, uh, if, you, if you can't build it, then you don't understand it. Mm -hmm. And so there's this idea, uh, if you can build it, then you can, right? Uh, you, have to, uh, you have to, if you can build it, you understand it, right? Mm -hmm. But that clearly is not the case anymore, right? And that's what I asked them is, so I'm like, hey, you built this thing called DeepMind AlphaGo. Do you really understand what's going on inside? And of course, the answer is no, we don't. And so the ethical question here, and it's, it's very interesting, uh, the West and China and the EU have taken very different positions on what, what I call uh, explainability uh, versus efficiency. Um, and so efficiency is, um, do you want an AI to be able to tell you with 99% accuracy if you have cancer or not. Uh, but you can explain how it came to that decision. Or do you want it to have 80% accuracy, right? So it can get things wrong, but you can explain how it came to that decision, right? And both China and the US, they're of course on this AI race. This is the new space race, right? In this AI race is we want the best performing uh, intelligence regardless, we don't care. But the EU, the European Union has says, no, we, we want, and, and so the AI companies in Europe are required to be able to explain how did it came to this decision, right? Because when we outsource more and more of these decisions to machines, um, you want to be able to explain it, right? At least that's the EU position but the superpowers of China and US are, are not taking that position. And so that's, that's a, I think, a fascinating ethical question to, to start asking. Um, uh, efficiency versus um, uh, explainability. And then the other interesting layer around data is, of course, you, you, you train these neural nets with your data set, right? And so the intelligence of this data, uh, your neural net is based on your data set, right? And so in all modern AI companies, uh, the algorithm doesn't matter anymore, it's the data set, right? And so right now it's a few companies that have this data set, right? 
But what's interesting is, and in, in EU is, I think, taking the right position here, right, is it, with GDPR. Are, are you familiar with GDPR, this global data protection? Um, and, you know, r r right now in China, of course, any data uh, is open for all to mine and, 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 and glean sort of intelligence from, right? Uh, in, in, in some sense, the U.S. as well. But the problem is... Uh, the Chinese, for example, the Chinese population, although very big, is also a very homogeneous population, mm -hmm. right? And so for whatever intelligence you're gleaning from, whatever prejudice uh, that you uh, produce out of these algorithms, it's applicable to Chinese people, mm -hmm. right? Now, what's fascinating about the Europeans is the Europeans are the most diverse people group. And they're not giving up their data, and so you can't gain intelligence uh, about those people groups, which is the most diverse people groups. And so the question of how intelligent is this intelligence when it's prejudiced with one people group versus, uh, a, you know, it, an intelligent has to take an accounts to many different nuances. That's how you call it intelligent. And so this is not really that intelligent. Right? And so uh, it all comes down to that data set again. And so there's a few layers of this discussion around ethics, around explainability, productivity, data sets, you know, diversity of data sets. But yeah, we, we definitely need to be very conscious about the prejudices that are built in. In the past hundred years, the most dominant company have been oil companies, right? They've been. Uh, Standard Oil, right, Exxon Mobil. Um, and, uh, and I think almost everybody in the technology understand that data is the new oil, right? Mm -hmm. And absolutely, if we don't do anything about uh, um, digital property, these few companies will be dominant for the next 100 years. They will dominate for 100 years. Yeah. They're the new monopolies. I think all these endeavors in technology are well and good. My question is about accessibility. Usually when a product or any type of technology, especially products that ensure um, the, the ownership of your data or, or your data safety, um, when it goes out on the market, it's usually targeting higher income people and younger people. While on the other hand, there's low income people and people like my elderly relatives that, that are so, uh, they're technophobic. They, they don't, they're like, they're like, I don't want to get near a computer. I don't want somebody knowing everything about me. And so how would you make your product and, and the, the technology that's to come accessible to everybody? It takes a lot of time for sure. Yeah. And it takes a lot of evangelism and getting and building community around building these, uh, building this vision out. You know, I do see myself like I travel to, you know, many different countries speak and then I work with the community there. Um, and I reflect how I reflect on Paul's journey on that, too. Right. Mm -hmm. He literally goes to different city in a city, talking to a small group of people who are these weirdos that, mm -hmm. you know, believe in something that uh, that's anti-imperial, that's, you know, countercultural and. In some sense, I'm doing the same, right? I'm, I'm finding these little pockets in, in different cities around the world and, and finding like-minded people and uh, to start building this ecosystem out. And, and I agree right now it's not accessible, but um, uh, but the goal is to include Gentiles as well, right? <laughs> uh, uh, and, and make it accessible to, to, to everybody. Uh, that's definitely the goal. We're definitely not there yet. I mean, this, it makes me think about the, the original promise of the internet, right? The original promise of the internet was to make it accessible for everybody, right? Um, and this internet uh, has been hijacked into, you know, owning people's data. And there's this whole study around how uh, lower income people who can't pay for these services have to spend all their time watching ads, right? And then, of course, the, the thing that they're paying for is their their attention, right? 
Um, and, in, and so in that sense, the services are inaccessible, right? And so um, that, that's, that's something I think about all the time is how do we build a technology um, that has this built-in bias to be more accessible? But from the, what's fascinating about Bitcoin is from the get-go, uh, it stands for those four things, right, that I said. It's open, it's, neutral, uh, it's censorship resistant, it's neutral, and it's borderless, right? All of these things were uh, a reaction to um, the 2008 financial crisis, which has everything to do with excluding, you know, people who are unbanked, right, and, and people who didn't have access to that. Uh, financial capital, that, that whole system. Bitcoin was a complete reaction to that. And, and in fact, when Bitcoin was first launched in this Genesis block, he included this um, newspaper article, uh, 2009, about uh, some, some bank bailing out um, um, this debt, right? And it, it's just, it really is the rich bailing out the rich. And I had this conversation with Tom Wright uh, when I hosted him in Hong Kong, and he's for years as an Anglican bishop, he's been um, lobbying and trying to push the IMF, right, to 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 forgive the debts of you know nations uh, uh, in Africa that have these debts, right? And they were and their response was, you can't do this, blah blah blah, right? Um, but when it came to 2008, it was it was an easy decision, right, to for the rich to bail out the rich. But for the rich to bail out the poor, no, we can't do that. Yeah. Bitcoin is, at least right now, it's fundamentally different, is, is those four things. It's a reaction to the 2008 financial crisis. But it's also, the way I interpret it right now, is it's, it's a reaction to the walled gardens uh, and the firewalls uh, of, of, of the internet, that the, the, the way the internet is built today. The internet is in many senses, very inaccessible, very uh, censorship, non-resistant, right? And very manipulative. It's, it's all those things, right? And it's, it's become the, the manipulation machine. And so that sense is completely inaccessible to, to uh, the original promise of it, right? And what Bitcoin represents is, is you know, the opposite of that, right? You know, it tries to be um, borderless. It tries to be censorship resistant, um, and, and all those things that have a built-in bias for accessibility, right? Um, but it still takes wet code, human beings, to maintain that. Like, you, it takes a lot of work, a lot of evangelizing, a lot of marketing and persuasion, and a lot of capital, and a lot of you know just human intention to make it continue to be those four things, right? Because if you compare Bitcoin to, you know, what people, uh, these new blockchains, it's, 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 um, it's none of that. It's, it's very, very centralized, right? There are many companies in the space that claim to be decentralized, but they're actually very centralized. Um, and even this whole space around, you know, Facebook coin or JP Morgan, uh, you know, the two quintessential monopolists of the 20th and the 21st century, they're both doing their own private coins, right? It's completely centralized. It's completely built in bias for inaccessibility. I would just say that at least in the beginning, we start out uh, to be open and permissionless, right? The, the whole thing with Facebook and JP Morgan coin, it's, it's a permission blockchain. Whereas Bitcoin is a permissionless, so anybody can, theoretically, anybody can do it, right? And so um, it has a built-in bias for accessibility, uh, but it does take the community. And when you build this community out to continue to hold on to that vision, right? Um, and so in that sense, it's very human-centric, right? It still takes humans within communities to continue to maintain that freedom and, and those, those pillars. I'm 
technologically incompetent. So I would rely um, in other realms that I'm incompetent to be able to elect leaders that would be serving my best interests. Uh, but I think from all these like Facebook hearings and Twitter hearings, it's obvious that our politicians are not up to the task of learning how to regulate or protect our interests. Um, so therefore, do you think that regulation doesn't really have a place in governing um, the protection of technologically incompetent or um, just the general population, and it should be entrepreneurially driven to implement, you know, these ethics that you're talking about. Or, I guess, how how do we either how do we protect the people who are not able to even understand how that the the state they're in, they're, you know? I think it's definitely both and, both and. Like, I see myself as one of the entrepreneurs doing this on the grassroots level, so bottom up. I absolutely do think that. Uh, government and regulation should approach this from a top-down perspective. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you escape this curse of bigness? Mm -hmm. You know, whenever it's big, then it becomes imperial, then it becomes manipulative, then it becomes too powerful and too, um, you know, all the curses that comes with being too big and too powerful and too self-worshipping and, you know, all of those things. And so... It, it, I think we need to, and I, I actually wrote an op-ed on this um, where Elizabeth Warren, I see what she's doing at, at least, and uh, you know, I also don't think she understands it the right way, but at least from a top-down level, she's trying to put some regulation on it. And I do think that what the European Union is doing and what they stand for with protecting people's privacy and data from a regulation side, I, I, that's absolutely necessary. And they're kind of like... Um, um, the shining light in, the, in, in, in this industry, right? And so I, it has to happen top down and bottom up. It, it needs to happen in the Supreme Court, the court justice, and it has happened before, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I think there was a, there's a whole precedence around, especially during the Theodore uh, Roosevelt um, uh, um, administration, how he went after the two biggest monopolists, John D. Rockefeller and J.P. Morgan. Right, and was able to break that up, right? I think um, in starting with Reagan and the Bush administration, that was completely sort of reversed. And then now you see these tech companies not being regulated and they're getting bigger and bigger and stronger and stronger. And hence, you know, the Google, Amazon, Facebook, Microsofts of this world, right? And so it has happened before, right? And, and so, um, uh, but who's going to be that profit of decentralization or, or that judge uh, in government, I don't know. Uh, but that absolutely needs to happen uh, within government. Since you are a proud alum of this grand institution, who, like many institutions, uh, both Christian and academic, are always behind, <laughs> if you were going to imagine for us what theological education ought to be, given what you've just said, and maybe you could just say, here's one thing, it doesn't have to be everything, but here's one thing that in your mind, here's where a seminary should be moving in terms of how it develops, trains, and sends people out into the world. Given what you're seeing in technology, what would that, what would that thing be? I would just first, first of all, I don't know. Uh, but I would just say that for me, my years at Fuller were, were extremely valuable. Um, the time I spent studying and reading um, you know, whatever books on Paul, whatever, you know, philosophies, you know, Wittgenstein or Gottenberg, it was... You dropped an Alasdair McIntyre book. Alasdair McIntyre, uh, René Girard. It really helped me integrate uh, uh, my theology into the workplace. And, uh, but that was all work that I did myself. Uh, I, I had no mentor, no help in that sense, right? Um, like when I go around saying, you know, uh, I don't, I haven't heard anybody say, you know, going around trying to build technology communities is the same thing that Paul is doing with, you know, evangelizing, or, you know, uh, building churches and community. It's, but it's the same, right? You're building community with some message, right? And so, uh, th those years were, were extremely valuable for me. So I don't know how... Uh, to replace that. I don't know if there's a better, except just to take it more seriously when you're here. Um, 
I do find, uh, although the form is archaic, um, if you as a person put in the time and the effort, um, it, it does build a great foundation. But for me, the, the, the other thing I would say is I do learn, I, I'm, I'm continually learning and I would say everything I learn on Bitcoin is just, you know, watching a lot of YouTube. You know, there is no Bitcoin university, right? Mm -hmm. You know, how did you, how did I find that Paul uh, on, on Bitcoin? And, and, you know, there are these resources on, on YouTube, right? And YouTube has been this dominant information and education platform. Um, where so I mean, like, if you think about Netflix, it's about storytelling, right? ESPN or Disney's about brands and family, but YouTube has been this education and information platform. Uh, I'm sure you guys heard about this guy named Jordan Peterson. Um, he has this whole lecture series on the book of Genesis, uh, the psychological foundations of, I think, scripture or something like that. But the fact that he has millions of views on a two-hour lecture is, is fascinating. There's so much hunger for this type of content. I mean, to say that people don't care or don't hunger for this, we're absolutely wrong in that sense, right? There's something wrong with our churches when we're not, when somebody like him can have millions of views on a two hour lecture, it's ridiculous, right? People can get millions of views in a three minute music video. And, and, and he's obviously hit on some formula that's able to get that type of exposure, right? Um, and so, you know, I would just, th those are my comments. I, I, I don't know how, uh, how academia can change. You know, except I, that I found it very valuable. I, I think to summarize what you just said, uh, the president of Fuller said this thing called, and I don't know if he stole it from somewhere else, but um, being rooted in tradition, with, like a tree, rooted in tradition, but with branches in innovation. So kind of what you're describing of like, we, you can't lose your rootedness and sort of a Jewish, the technology of, you know, writing your alphabet on these sort of, you know, uh, uh, placards, but at the same time, not denying the, the need for innovation is a real tension at the heart of the Christian faith, really. Um, so I thank you for your time, uh, for your work uh, in the field and uh, for your uh, insights today. Can we give them a round of applause? Uh,